When it comes to implementing bigger intelligent software, you really have to start with the end in mind. In an era where every nail hammered, every beam placed and every brick laid can be augmented by technology, Power BI emerges as a beacon of efficiency and insight. From project management to resource allocation, from cost estimation to risk mitigation, this robust business intelligence tool has been making waves across the construction sector, revolutionizing the way projects are planned, executed and managed. This software does the improbable and starts to integrate the supply chain, converting seemingly unrelated sources of data into coherent and interactive visualizations, assisting architects with conceptual visuals, project managers striving for better insights, and contractors aiming to optimize operations. But this is only the case if we have the skills and abilities to use this type of software at our disposal. So do we? And if we do, is Power BI the one and only platform that can help us achieve greater integration and collaboration at a digital level, empowering decision makers to navigate the complexities of construction projects with clarity and confidence? We need to chat to someone who will help us uncover the insights and best practices that can propel construction towards greater efficiency, productivity, and ultimately success. Samuel Arsenal Brassard, Head of Product at VIM AEC, is an authority in BIM data analysis and Power BI auditing, a dynamic force in architectural innovation and digital artistry. He has carved a niche in blending physical and virtual realms. As a BIM expert, his work spans from the practical aspects of architectural technology to the creative arenas of lighting design and XR art which sounds truly mesmeric. <laughs> In the realm of digital art, he is a recognized XR artist and curator with works displayed at various galleries and his presentations on topics like metaverse architecture, coupled with his art shows, illustrate his commitment to exploring and shaping the intersection of technology, art, and architecture. Sam, Welcome to the podcast. And is there anything I've missed off that intro? No, thanks for having me, Peter. Abs absolute pleasure. And and some of the things that are in your in your bio uh, might need some explaining, but we'll we'll get there as we uh, as we as we go along. Hope you don't mind that. Um, Want to dive straight into it? And I think we all know that utilizing data can improve safety. Um, produce greater compliance, establish performance and predictive trends for future planning in projects and, and, and everything and, and can benefit the whole supply chain within construction, really. Yet, despite these benefits, one study in America found that only 50 percent of contractors consistently capture and review project data to measure construction project performance, while another study reported the scale of content that occurs during one sing singular large-scale project, this was a bit mind-blowing, averages 130 million emails and 55 million documents, where only 0.5% of that data goes <laughs> used. Um, so technically, we've managed so far, we've done all right, we're building things, but What's the importance of managing and utilizing data? Let's start with that. Yeah, I mean, so what we're proposing is instead of using email uh, to go back to Morse code and faxes, no, um, the, the you <laughs> job know, done. This is this is this isn't how I thought this would go. <laughs> we're really disrupting everything. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think really, it's a big question, right? So what data, what data is important. Obviously, at the end of the day, we want to build things. We don't just want to, um, you know, write a thousand emails and try to manage that. Uh, we want to have, I mean, a, a big part of it, frankly, comes from, you know, issues in design. Uh, it comes from mm -hmm. the, the kind of mentality of the minimum bid. 
So we say, hey, who can do this the cheapest? And then people will undercut each other and make mistakes, obviously, because they're all trying to undercut each other. And then at the end of that day comes the lawyers saying, hey, you said you could do this for this price. And then there were all these errors and they triple the price. And so that's maybe where the some of the communication and those argumentative emails come in and 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 people arguing about things but that's not that's that's kind of the result of a bigger problem really mm -hmm. um there are obviously we want to go towards more collaboration more clarity and if we imagine mm -hmm. that we didn't have the problems of the minimum bid contracts uh there are still going to be some clarifications required I'd say kind of unfortunately the architect is no longer the master builder that understands everything about construction. Now, this is going to vary from country to country, but, mm -hmm. you know, on a theoretical level, you'd want the architect to be kind of a super great contractor who guides the contractor uh, with additional rules and aesthetics um, so that the job is easier for the contractor. But with the whole minimum bid mentality, you have uh, often architects who don't actually understand construction, who are guessing the drawings, who are guessing the details, and then saying, figure it out. Um, and then you get a really nice soup of lawsuits and problems uh, through that process. So it depends. I think it's really a, a landscape of data, right? We have different softwares that do different things. This is not just about Revit and Power BI. This is not just about IFC and Power BI. It's about uh, Franco-Lingua of data and really being needy. Uh, because you may get a software that does 30% of your work and emails that do another 20% of your work and you get these constellation of software and at the end of the day there's not necessarily a consolidation of them and a control over them as a you know ex BIM manager BIM coordinator um, you get really smart you get into these advanced workflows but you're still kind of praying for the software gods to add a button you're still kind of begging in the forums to add a toggle you're still at the mm -hmm. mercy of the software developers so i think really when you know in our case we're looking at power bi and power bi mm -hmm. uh allows you to take full control of well first off that landscape of data whether it's coming from 10 or 20 or three different sources and then full control over how that data is shown. Um, and I, I compare it a little bit to the transition between AutoCAD and Revit. It's a big like, mm -hmm. oh, this seems harder. There's more capabilities. What's in it for me? And, you know, it, it's, well, you need new skills, right? And so new investments, new skill, new time investment, new things, a bit of a scary new landscape. And then really people at first are like, what's in it for me? Uh, the, the people that have been wanting to go from Revit or IFC to Power BI for many years, they know what's in it for them. Uh, they're excited to get those new toggles, those new buttons to, to harmonize everything. But mm -hmm. for the owner, it may not be. I mean, we still have owners that are uh, don't know why they need Revit, right? So it's there's <laughs> always laggards and there's always people that are ahead of the game. What we're alluding to here is is the fact that data is important, but you still need the right tools and you need to manage it in in a way that that makes sense for you or your your sector or or whatever you do. And that might mm -hmm. be very different and use very different platforms to other people with the same the same data set. Um, so, so, you know, we can get a lot from that information. Uh, you, you touched upon Power BI there. So I just want to come on to that. And I think some mm -hmm. of the listeners will be familiar with that. Um, and a few will have heard of, of, of Vim. But can you give the lowdown on these two platforms? Give us a bit of a, a synopsis of both of them. Yeah, so let's start with Power BI. So Power BI is kind mm -hmm. of the star product of Microsoft right now. And Power BI uh, is really trying to, well, harmonize it. It's, it's a data monster, right? It takes data. It can take data from anywhere. You can throw anything at it. It'll gobble it up. And then it allows you to kind of pretzel that data in any kind of way you want. Like, for example, you may get issues from, um, you know, Autodesk Cloud Construction and, uh, you know, three different platforms like BIM Track or Newforma Connect or BIM Colab. 
And then those are all going to come in different formats. Some of them may have X, Y, Z points. Some of them may have, you know, they'll come in different names and you can take all of those and harmonize them in a single table where they all use the same thing. And, and they basically uh, become harmonious in the way that you can show issues from any software and it's coming in. Um, so Power BI is really good at taking data from anywhere, whether it's the web, databases, Excel files, CSVs, and letting you control that data fully. Um, we do a lot of the work so that you don't have to start from scratch, and it is kind of a new software. It also is really good for sharing dynamic links. So we're no longer talking about PDFs. We're talking about, uh, you know, I send you a link, you open the web page, you don't need to download anything, it's just on the web. And if you want to see how much glass you have, you click on the glass and you got the data. If you want to see how much the columns are going to cost on phase three, how much concrete there is, you click on that and you see the data that you want. So it's no longer a 250 page PDF, it's one page that's dynamic. And I guess the third part of the customizability, right? So it kind of puts you, it gives you the power of being a developer, a software developer, without having to learn how to code. It's more like a drag and mm. drop. Um, you do need to do, you do need to have an expert kind of wrangling the data and giving it to you so that it can be drag and drop. And this is kind of where we come in. There's also a couple other things like Power Apps will let you write to the data. So you can say, for example, here's an issue, here's the status, here's the RFI, and then Power Automate will let you react to the data. So for example, if the project is 10% overrun, it may send an email or a Slack message or a Teams message to the manager, the owner, whoever. You can have these kind of alarms. And then you could even do IoT, right? Uh, oh, the temperature is this high, we detected it, let's open the windows, et cetera. So that's Power BI. We are along for the ride with Power BI. It's great because we're married to them and we get all of those capabilities that keep evolving and getting stronger. What we do is we really marry the architecture side of things. So through right now, Revit and IFC, we are talking to the Revit SDK and extracting every single bit of data that we can. Um, and it's not just the elements and the parameters and all the parameters, it's things like the phase filters, things like the warnings, things like the materials, the uh, layers of material. So with our deep BIM expertise, we go beyond just elements and um, elements and their parameters. And then it's really the fusion of that with Power BI, right? So how do we transform mm -hmm. all of this data so that it's scalable, it's usable, it's comprehensible? And also as we create, we create a lot of um, reports themselves. And I should add actually another big component is the 3D viewer. So it's not just the data. Okay. When you select all the floors, you see all the floors. If you select all the floors on first floor, you see all the floors on first floor mm -hmm. in 3D. Um, so there's that. And then the third part is really the templates, right? So we'll do a parameter audit template, a work set audit template. And in the software world, there's this thing called dog fooding, which means using your own software. And so it's not just like, here's a software. It theoretically should work. It's like, no, no, we'll actually use it. And then we go, oh, geez, well, that's, that's slow. That table doesn't talk to that table. Oh, I really, we should have a new column to check for this thing. And so through this constant using of our own software, we refine the theoretical data model in Power BI to a real um, data model for architecture. And maybe one last thing is, yeah, if you're coming from the world of Revit, uh, well, Power BI needs a lot of front-loaded effort. You kind of need the smartest person in the room to do the hardest work before it's easy for everybody else. And this is okay. kind of what we've done. In the Revit world, it's the equivalent to the BIM philosophy, the BIM execution plan, the BIM standard, the BIM template, the BIM families. Once you've done all that really smart work, some fool can come in and drag a table and it shows up in all the views and it shows up in the schedule and it's all great. But for the 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 you know the intern to come in and drag that table, there's a lot of front-loaded work into it. So that's what we've done and we maintain and we evolve. It's what's called the data model in Power BI so that you don't have to spend a year or two dealing with it. We did that mm -hmm. work so that you can just do actual work, you know, that you need to do. One thing that you started to to, to build upon there is we started almost the back end and, and, and the coding and, and the, the groundwork, the foundational work um, so that other people can use it without needing that 
skill, and we'll come on to skills a, a little bit later. Um, but one thing that I'd like to, particularly with your background, a um, little bit of preamble into this question, but in doing the research, I noticed a buyer's guide produced by Procore this year goes into a lot of detail about how to choose the right software for your own business, uh, questions to ask, checklists, and things like that to make sure you're getting what you want. And one simple statement that stood out to me, and it made so much sense, was a good solution should remove work, not add to it. Okay. Correct. Which yeah. is a great mantra in business, really. I think we can uh, agree with that. But when we're talking about the output we receive from software like like Vim and the visualization um, and, and what we're seeing, which you started to allude to, what does good look like? Is is this hugely dependent on what you're achieving or is there a, a set standard here that we all should look to, look to um, abide by and emulate? I think at the end of the day, good looks digestible and understandable right if you look at the template and you could give it to your grandpa and grandma and they're going to get it uh, then you've done a good job right like let's say you have a template that analyzes the parking lots uh, in power bi and you look at it and you go okay yeah that's how many parking lots per area and uh, if i click uh, this i get this data and i get it um, if you can share it with your boss that knows nothing about Revit, if you can share it with the the owner of the building, if you can share it with any uh, subcontractor or contractor and they're going to get it, then you've reached that intuitive level. And so, I mean, this is what's part of Power BI, right? Is your, well, you may be given a template, we'll give you a template, but it may not be exactly what you need. And you may, you know, you may only care about elevators, for example, you may only care mm -hmm. about landscape. And so um, if you can cook up something in Photoshop, that's like, oh, that's exactly what I want. And then you do it in Power BI and you're like, okay, well, it was it was the exact thing. You know, it's not like some other software developers technical version of Excel of what that would look like. It's just very user friendly. It says you got 50 parkings, you got you know, 50,000 square feet, therefore it's this much parking per square feet, big numbers. And then, you know, whatever, uh, maybe you click on tower one and you see the parking for tower one. It's just kind of like designing a website, a website, right? You can mm. instantly say you go on a website and you go, okay, you know, remember Google 10 years ago, what are you looking for? You feeling lucky? There's two options. So that was intuitive. <laughs> Uh, versus Yahoo, which was like bombarding you with every single <laughs> pop up and, uh, you know, useless piece of information. You're like, oh, my God, I'm just, you know, trying to, I don't know, buy an Apple or something. Yeah, we're almost talking about on basic terms, WordPress in, in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, that provide a template, but you can essentially do anything to it as long as you know what you, you're doing. Is there the, the, the potential then that it's a bit overwhelming or overload uh almost like um, a kid in a sweet shop in in terms of there's so much choice and there's so much variety can pretty much do anything i just don't know yeah. what where to turn. absolutely i mean then that's the thing with intelligent software right we had that exact mm -hmm. problem with autodesk to revit where we used to like i see autodesk uh, autocad as like a line management tool and you all know a two by four is a symbol and been working this way. Like the Egyptians were doing the same thing, uh, drawing stuff on paper and we were managing lines. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, you can count the bricks. Oh my God, I can count the bricks. What am I going to do with these bricks? So I think, <laughs> you know, when, when it comes to uh, implementing bigger intelligent software, you really have to start with the end in mind. In BIM, mm -hmm. we call those BIM uses. So for example, hey, I can do estimation. Do I want to do estimation? How often? To what level? What do I care about? Do I care if, you know, the foot of the table is one millimeter in the floor? No. Do I care if there's a column going in my duct? Yes. So start mm -hmm. with the end in mind um, so you don't get lost in the sauce. And, you know, you don't necessarily let your programmers develop the end because they're very technical. And at the end of the day, it's like that. That's kind of why I said, like, if you you can mock it up in Photoshop uh, before yeah. you go into Excel and Power BI and look at, you know, mm -hmm. thousands of columns of code, like, what are you trying to do? What should it look like so that, um, you know, 
grandma and grandpa can get it the owner can understand it everybody can understand it then you can start about thinking about adding buttons and well a, a lot of bim folks don't get to do software development right they they'll make a template they'll make a thing and then i mean that's the magic of it right you you do a basic draft and it works and then you go does this work how do i feel about this right now what's missing what could i add and then that's your next little mission for the next couple hours i like it i like it that, that makes a, a whole host of, of sense and <clears throat> the way you're talking there's obviously a lot of skill and ability that goes into this and if we look at um construction architecture the built environment one of the the, the topics and it seems it dates back to to even the 80s is upskilling and having the skills to um to improve the industry there was a report that came out in 2021 by the citb in, in the uk suggested that about 50 percent of the workforce will need retraining in construction in one way or another yep um with power bi and its integrated powers do you see upskilling as relatively easy or is there going to be some tough years ahead or do we just try and pinch people from the gaming industry that can do that kind of thing well there's two ways to go about it right you either get a data analyst there's plenty of those you get a data analyst to try to understand your revit ifc problems not ideal i'm more of the opposite mm. way um and the thing is bim attracts a fair amount of smart people and attracts um cutting edge people like you know you can see this right away in the dynamo forums you can see this like bim people there's always a 20 percent of bim folks that are trying to see what's next vr ar they want to be mm -hmm. the little research and development they want to push things they want to be the first uh they're trying to do you know automate their schedules they're trying to find the next mm -hmm. coolest software those people are naturally there and i think so far they've been kind of blocked by Power BI because there hasn't been an easy bridge to Power BI. There's been these weird Dynamo uh, methods. There's been a couple, you know, software developers that have made a bridge to Power BI, but often their data model is very rudimentary. And I think it's really the data model that has been the bridge. Nobody's done okay. that marriage between BIM and Power BI because you have to learn to be a data analyst. Like two years ago, my boss was like, Sam, you have to become a Power BI expert. And I've gone in the deep end, but there's no way I could have done that at work if I had an actual job besides that, right? And, mm. you know, I probably went through like 40 different iterations of the data model, if not more. And we brought in some SQL experts. And I really see it as I'm, I'm preparing the path for BIM managers, BIM people to... It's like a good BIM template, right? You go in, things are properly named, things are organized, things you don't need to see are hidden. Um, and generally it's it's comprehensible. There's training available for it. There's documentation available for it. And it's continuously evolving. So um, I think that's really is what's going to open the gate for those Revit folks to learn Power BI properly. And you know, we'll have ACC connectivity soon, which means that right now to be honest it's a little bit like if you pay for our service there's more work because you have to convert all these files but with acc mm. connectivity that's just going to happen in the background so if you have 100 projects they just keep updating whenever you update them and nice. they the templates are up to date so that's uh that's you know automatically done and um then it's just about customizing the templates uh, for whatever project requirements you have. But you will need a champion in-house. You will need somebody much like 10 mm. years ago that says, you know what, I'm going to go from CAD to Revit. I'm going to ask my boss for some training hours. I'm going to take some time after work or I may even go back to school for a year or something. And I'm going to make the jump. And, you know, I'm, I'm ready for that adventure. It, it reminds me of, it was probably... I wouldn't like to say how many years, but say five, six, seven years ago, uh, listening to a, a, a podcast and it was talking about communication uh, within within marketing and saying that they found it crazy that there was a job advert for a, um, a TikTok creator. 
um, and designer. <laughs> and then it's like, how, how can we be that specific for that particular platform? Um, and it, it feels like there's a similar thing here, but on a bigger and grander and more important scale in that even smaller organizations will or should be looking to invest in some kind of developer, engineer, somebody that knows the numbers, the figures or the models or whatever it might be to suit their sector so that they're not that reliant on external, they're not that reliant on paying other people to do that. And and they have somebody that's part of their organization that at least understands what we're or, or, or understands what you're talking about on a on a deeper level here. I think that yeah. that's what it kind of springs out to to me. I mean, maybe sometimes people are like, oh, why should I care about this? And and this is going to be a weird metric, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes people will be like, I don't care about Power BI. Why should I care about this? Why should I learn this? And the people that do understand pay for it because they they see the vision. They know where it's going. They want to do this. Like It's, it's pretty mm -hmm. hard to get a Power BI expert under $100 per hour if you're hiring a consultant. So much like BIM managers are usually better paid than architects or you know the the they're some of the better paid people in the office especially if they're able to marry the architectural skills with the technology skill. If you got a BIM manager that doesn't know about architecture sure. it's a different you know conversation but um, this is a really good way to you know I, I'd say in, in my career it's been about finding uh, niches and specialties mm -hmm. that that nobody else has like lighting or vr or you know i've been going really deep into bim and the more specialties you have the more you're irreplaceable and rare mm -hmm. and this is definitely one of those where like you don't you don't need the whole team to know power bi right you need one or two or three people uh and once a template is done it's it's done and it can get evolved but it's like you don't need everybody at the office to do uh, web design you just need one yeah. or two or three good people and then it's fantastic to have that website etc so um the people that see the value the companies that see the value about streamlining customizing it for their exact needs they pay dearly and they understand they're getting their money in return and the people that invest in themselves get really exciting careers and it, it feels I, i'd say it's like you know there's bim technician uh, architects that mm -hmm. use Revit, there's a BIM manager, and you get more and more power over the workflow. But the ultimate power is, you know, basically kind of designing the software. And I don't want to learn coding, but I want that power. And this is where that yeah. magical tr threshold finally opens the door for us. Like, oh, I need a button. Let's go. I'm just going to add it right yeah. here. And I get that power without having to learn any coding at all. So let's um, let's bring it back to um, software in a way, uh, and and th there's a figure that that was out last year that said around about ninety four percent of organisations still use spreadsheets to manage data, and mm -hmm. eighty seven percent say that inconsistent processes and tech pose a challenge. I feel that there's so much technology out there; it's easy to to, to pile more and more technology on to try and solve problems where less is is more in most instances mm -hmm. um, do you feel that there's the space for multiple integrated systems to work together or do we need a more unified a, a approach where less options is actually more i mean obviously this way is more unified right like you said um like i i'm an i'm a excel nerd as well and i've gone a lot from Revit to Excel. And a lot of my processes, I would export the data in Excel, and then I would do like eight or 10 different operations, like a transformation, a merging, uh, some sort of test, another merging, a VLOOKUP with another table, refresh the pivot table, things like that. It turns out actually there's Power BI for uh, Excel. And if I would have known that yeah. five years ago, those <laughs> processes that I can't explain to people, I could have just plugged yeah. that right into Power BI and done it right there. Um, but my the thing that happened is those workflows, when I left those companies, nobody else was able to redo it, right? Because they didn't understand mm -hmm. Excel. Uh, if I would have just automated it with Power BI, I could have done so. Now, obviously, that's just in one Excel document. But the the same thing happens, right? That thing can be automated where, like right now I'm working on a carbon calculator 
and the software just spits out a CSV file, which you know, for simplicity, we'll just say it's like an Excel file. Now, my Power BI can go look in there and just update everything into all my tables. And uh, if if the carbon footprint of that wood or that concrete changes, I'm just going to click refresh, and it's all going to make it into the same place. So yes, um, you know, instead of having 50,000 different ways that people calculate their taxes across companies, it would be much better to have, you know, one singular approach that can be customized, but yeah. that there's a, there's a spine, there's a, there's a foundation mm -hmm. for how you do things. It's not just because if you got 50,000 people, let's say that try to go from Revit to Power BI using Dynamo, well, 30% of them are going to make major errors. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going to get the wrong number at the end. And, you know, very few are going to get to the best practices that will make the database fast and small and scalable, et cetera. So, yeah, you it's better to have like the best of brains and then allow that customization to happen on that unified format. What's next? What's what's coming up on the horizon? What do we need to be looking out for in, in terms of technology and 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 what do you think is important? Well, we're all going to lose our jobs and become DJs and or practitioners. Yeah. And, um, you know, much like cats, we'll, we'll have to find a benevolent AI to feed us and house us and be nice to us. Uh, Stroke and, us. You know, we'll just say my owner is better than your owner and they're quite <laughs> nice. They feed me fresh, raw food, uh, you know, and they looked at at my history and they saw how nice I was to pets and they decided uh, that I won the karma lottery. Um, no, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a long winded question. I think a long winded answer that, that, that could be, we could talk for a whole hour about it, but um, yeah, sure. Maybe one tidbit is there is some little bit of code called DAX sometimes in power BI that you need to write. And uh, chat GPT gives you the right answer like 60% of the time. So when you're talking about upskilling, 60% of the time is pretty good for the right answer uh, instead of like learning to code yeah. those little bits. So that's that's my my humorous and short answer to your question. No, that that's fantastic. Plus, it, it's actually relevant and it's it it's almost the here and and, and now and 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 uh a nod to the future 60% is a great start, a great marker. And I think that'll just in, improve and improve, um, as, as, as we go on for a one year old, it's pretty good. Right. Well, what I, what was I doing when I was one years old? <laughs> like... Exactly. And people forget that, don't they? It's, it's the buzzword. It's the brand new thing. So it needs to do everything. And if it's got an inkling of looking like there's an error, that's terrible. It'll never catch on. It'll never work. This is awful. Yeah. And like you said, it's one. <laughs> Fantastic. Like we've been teenagers, like we've been fools when we were young. So wait till it's 5, 10, 20, 50. Uh, it's going to be a whole different game by then. Oh, I love that. I love that analogy. That's brilliant. Sam, like you said, I could chat to you all day about this stuff. Thank you so, so much. What I'd like to do is, will you come back on in, in a while and, and we'll explore potentially the future going forward? That would be amazing. Let's future in the future. Yes. Let's future <laughs> in the future. I'm stealing that. Um, Sam, absolute pleasure. And we will chat soon. Thanks for your generosity, Peter. Have a great day.